and and we can work uh um we can be men without working as well as also without laboring but she is going to say on 176 the second page of this chapter that without acting and speaking we can't be men now this is not a statement about the human nature right it's a statement again about the condition of being human as it's emerged in the western tradition or in the tradition not even the western tradition but in the tradition of humanity um over the last two or three thousand years and um what she wants to say is that without speech and action men are literally dead to the world um we don't live in the world in the condition of humanity that has been created and emerged without speaking and acting um action is for her a kind of second birth a birth into the human world and so um there is a kind of priority an important priority of action that doesn't mean that action is the most important because without work without art as we described the last couple of weeks it would not be possible for action to be remembered and thus to create truly human lives you need art and work you need labor in addition to uh, action but in order to be fully human she says the one thing that each human needs is to act and speak um uh so but having put that out there as an overarching rubric let's look at the chapter chapter five on action she starts it with two uh epigraphs by isaac denison and and dante the first is about the power of storytelling and the second is about the idea of self-disclosure of who one is as opposed to what one is and these two ideas stories and who i am are going to uh in a sense uh frame and dominate this whole chapter on action in short i only am a person become a person in the human world insofar as stories are told about me and i only have stories told about me insofar as I act, insert myself into the world. Um, and so uh, in order to be a public person, to engage and become human, I have to risk acting and then uh, have stories told about me. And uh, we will pursue both of these uh, as we go, as we go forth. I want to start section 24, which is really uh lays out some very important and 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 fascinating concepts uh let's look at the first sentence of on page 175 where Arendt writes human plurality the basic condition of both action and speech has the twofold character of equality and distinction human plurality not diversity not difference what is plurality well, on the one hand, plurality is the condition of politics. And on the other hand, um, she says it is the condition of action and speech. Why? Well, because if we're all the same, equal, we wouldn't be able to speak. We would need to speak to others. And uh, action um, would not be something we would ever have to do. We would all just be the same. So plurality is the condition for acting and speaking and thus for politics but the second part of the sentence is the one i really want to focus on human plurality has the twofold distinction of equality and distinction twofold character of equality and distinction on the one hand you can't have plurality without equality you can't have plurality without us all being equal uh because i couldn't speak to you i couldn't be aware you and i are aware unless we had something that holds us together that unites us the, but the more important side is that plurality depends upon distinct distinction 
And distinction, she then separates into three categories. On the one hand is otherness, which is the stone is other from that stone. And, you know, the, the tree is other from that tree, the alteritas of objects. Then there's the distinction of organic living creatures, like this plant is different from that plant, or this plant is different from the human being. But the most important part of distinction that she wants to talk about is what she calls uniqueness. Uniqueness is what separates one human being from another. Speech and action, she says in the first paragraph on 176, or the first full paragraph, speech and action reveal this unique distinction. Through them, men distinguish themselves instead of being merely distinct. What is uniqueness? It is that special thing that separates and distinguishes a human being from another human being. It's what makes us unique. What is it? Well, it, it's what is our essence, what grows up from us and separates each one of us. It's our experiences, our hereditary, our family, and it comes out of the private, right? And we've talked a lot about the importance of the private for our end over and over again. It's in the private realm where we see things ourselves, not the way everybody in society sees them, not the way we see them through equality, but in our sort of crazy, individualistic, unique perspective. And human plurality is, has the character of both equality and distinctness. And it's this uniqueness, this unique distinctness that action and speech reveal in the world. Um, at the bottom of page 176, where she talks about how without action and speech, we are literally dead to the world. Um, she says at the very bottom, with word and deed, we insert ourselves into the human world. And this insertion is like a second birth, second birth. We are all born biologically and we will all die. But we are not human for our end, again, not a natural sense, but in a conditional sense, until we insert ourselves into the human world with speech and action, word and deed. Um, she then describes speech and action in the next few paragraphs. To act is to initiate. It's to be free. It's to do something that begins a process that's not, and thus is free. And by free, what she means here, and you can see it on 178, is that it cannot be expected. This is the very top, top of 178. This character of startling unexpectedness is inherent in all beginnings and in all origins. Thus, the origin of life from inorganic matter is an infinite improbability. The new, she says a few lines down, always happens against the overwhelming odds of statistical laws and their probability, which for all practical everyday purposes amounts to certainty. The new therefore always appears in the guise of a miracle. This is unique to our end. It's fantastically interesting. You cannot have politics without miracles. Right. Uh, the miraculous is part of the human world. Often people today think miracles are what, you know, we got over when we left religion and went into reason. From our end's point of view, that's exactly wrong. All real politics is miraculous. Uh, and she repeats this at length in her essay on what is freedom. Uh, what that means is that this is one reason that Arendt, despite sometimes seeming quite pessimistic, is always an optimist, because her basic view is that no matter how improbable change is, no matter how improbable transformation, for good or bad, is, the world will always change. The worst totalitarianism will end. The greatest republic will end. Uh, 
something new will always emerge as long as there are human beings. And this is, this is the source of, of, of so much of her thinking that in the end, anyone who says, oh, technology is destroying the world or technology will turn us into robots or the, te- the singularity is near or uh, you know, capitalism is ruining things. Anyone who makes these kind of statements that this is over or this is the new way for her misunderstands action and politics and humanity because um, within humanity is always the possibility of the miraculous and the new. In order to act and start something new, you have to act in a way that people will pay attention, right? Uh, If you just uh, go to work every day and don't have a family and come home and live alone and never go out, you know, you're generally going to be one of those invisible people. Now, maybe no one's fully invisible and I don't want to, you know, we can get into that. But invisibility of the poor for our rent is the greatest danger to politics. The invisibility of those who don't act in such a way that others take notice of them is the great danger to their humanity and to politics. And so in order to act and have people tell a story about you, You have to be courageous. You have to leave your private security and enter into a risky public world where people might tell good stories about you, tell bad stories about you, or they may kill you. And, uh, or they may make you king so that you have no time to play chess with your son. Second part of chapter 24, um, which begins on 178, where Arendt says um, that action and speech uh, are related to the question, who are you? So this is, um, once we know that it's in action that we do something spontaneous and unexpected and new, once it's, we know that it's in action that we, in a sense, make ourselves visible to others, insert ourselves into the human world, then the question is, who are we? Who are we? And she says that the disclosure of who somebody is, is implicit in both his words and deeds. So in the way you speak and in the way you act, you disclose who you are. Um, And it's in doing so, you become part of the human world and thus become human, at least in this second sense. Um, action and speech thus reveal ourselves. They reveal ourselves as unique, appearing uh, who's, as opposed to what's. Um, first point. Action and speech insert us into a humanly built world as who's, not what's. Second point, who we are is never in our control. Why is that? Why is who we are not in our control? Because when we insert ourselves into the world, we don't control how people will see us. Who we are becomes then a public fact, a public result of our interaction with others. Um, In risking disclosure and entering the world, uh, we enter a world with others. We're not lonely anymore. Um, And we seek that what she calls on 180 at the bottom of this first full paragraph, we seek the shining brightness, which we once called glory and which is possible only in the public realm. But to find that means that we will be 
talked about by others. And thus, if you look at chapter 25, we enter what she calls the web of relationships and the enacted stories. Um, we enter a world uh, in which we exist primarily as acting and speaking beings. And in doing so, we enter a world that she calls on page 182, a world of interests. And she uses interests in its ancient Greek sense of inter esse. Inter meaning um, between, and esse meaning being, to be. It's this being in between, this between being that we enter, which is the world of the plurality of men who we now act and speak in such a way that this plurality of men uh, takes notice of us and begins telling stories about us, sometimes documenting our history in documents, sometimes memorializing us in monuments, um, as she says on, on pages 183. And uh, this, this interest, this in-between world, is just as much a part of the world as the world of tools and the world of things that are created by work and by artists. And so what we see is that the world now is split between the objective world of things and the web of human relationships, which is the world that goes on in between humans and things and between different humans. Um, Because of that, when I act, I can't control my story. And thus, acting is always, as she says on 184, it never achieves its purpose. If I act with the purpose of ending capitalism, John, I have no idea what my act will achieve. And it's quite likely that it will achieve something quite different from what I set out to, uh, to do. Um, and, uh, and so there's this kind of frustration in all actions, and yet uh, we need to act. Why do we need to act? Why do we act, given the fact that we can't control our actions? Because, and this is to go back to the Dante quote that opened the chapter, right? There's a kind of, um, there's a kind of, uh, as she says, desire and delight in doing. Uh, elsewhere in her work, she'll say that there is a, an inexplicable urge for all living things to reveal themselves, to appear and be taken notice of. Um, she'll cite biologists about the beauty of butterflies or the beauty of flowers. And what she'll say is all living things want to appear, want to be talked about, want to be taken notice of, um, want to come into the world in some way. Bees and butterflies need to do it so they can reproduce. We need to do it partly to reproduce, but also because there's a desire for humans to become gods, right? To go back to glorify ourselves, to immortalize ourselves, to do things that others will say are great and lasting and deserve to be great and lasting. Um, and so there's a kind of uh, heroic nature to, to actions. And on 186, she'll say the, the hero of the story discloses doesn't actually need heroic qualities, right? What it needs, and the only thing that a hero of a story needs is courage. That's Now, maybe courage is a heroic quality. I don't know. But what she says is the only thing you need to act is courage. Courage and even boldness is the very bottom uh, of 186. The connotation of courage 
which we now feel to be an indispensable quality of the hero, is in fact already present in a willingness to act and speak at all. To insert oneself into the world and begin a story of one's own. Which is why she'll go back on back on 36. She says, courage is the first virtue of politics. And she is here, courage and even boldness are already present in leaving one's private hiding place and showing who one is in disclosing and exposing oneself. You know, there's different levels of courage, but you being here, your picture's on this screen, asking a question, courage, inserting yourself in the world, wanting to be seen, risking it boldly. Um, which is why she'll say that drama and theater are the truly political arts um, because they imitate and put on stage for others to see um, uh, some act. And as an imitation of acting, they make acting uh, visible and thus enact a kind of politics. Um, this last section is called The Frailty of Human Affairs. And, and here uh, she makes um, a, you know, a, a very important point that will become incredible, that will now structure uh, much of the rest of the chapter. So I hope you, I hope you, can, you can stay with us. Um, there are two ideas of action, right? One is arcane or to begin or set in motion. And the other is protein which is to finish or to bear the result. Um, and what she wants to say here is that the, uh, well, both are, are important, but it's the idea of the leader or the ruler who initiates the action. That is how we sort of, how we often imagine action. But we often think of the leader as the sovereign, the one who controls the action. And what she says is that's not right. Um, the leader initiates, but there's a lack of control. Even the most powerful king, can, like Creon, can make an edict, but he can't control what Antigone is going to do. And so um, there is no leadership uh, or action is not the same thing as sovereignty. And beginning an action is always a risk and we lose control of its end. If we take that seriously, there are three, what she calls frailties or dangers in all action. The first is that action is boundless. It's never a closed circle. So on 190 um, to 191, she says the very, very bottom, Limitations and boundaries exist within the realm of human affairs, but they never offer a framework that can reliably withstand the onslaught with which, each, with which each new generation must insert itself. We have institutions, we have customs, we have rules, we have traditions, and you know they all exist and they are limitations and boundaries. We have borders. But each new generation can overstep those borders, boundaries, limits, mores, customs, and traditions. And thus, no action can control things, can close the circle. It is boundless. And so we can think, I'm going to make a health care law so that people will be healthier and it will help the you know help uh the poor and yet we don't control how that's going to work out or what's going to happen or the technical difficulties that are going to emerge etc we can say i'm going to take over the ukraine and fight a war and i may have some success for a while but i have no ability to control and to bound my action. And a corollary of that is that my action is irreversible. Once I start it and unleash a process, I can't put the genie back in the bottle. Um, 
This is why she'll say that moderation is praised by Aristotle as a virtue, um, because action has, we have to act with the knowledge that we can't control our action. We need a certain humility. That's the first danger or frailty of action, that it's boundless. The second is that it's unpredictable. Um, we simply cannot predict what our actions will, will bring. Um, and since only after we die can we know how we will be remembered, uh, action is not something uh, we can control. Um, and thus, it's dangerous. And the third aspect of the danger of, of action that she'll talk about later in the book is that it's anonymous. Um, in the end, uh, most great things that happen are not the result of one person, right? I mean, this is the, we have the great man theory of action versus the, you know, the time or the era theory of action. But most great things that are happen happen because of the actions of millions of people many of which we don't know about. And so action is anonymous and thus we are not responsible for the impacts of our actions. You know, people are talking a lot about microaggressions today and it's a very complicated topic. I don't want to go into it fully, but part of the idea is that little things we do that we often don't know about lead to great pains or sufferings on other people. That's true in all areas of the world. What many people today want to say is we should hold the people who do those little actions responsible for their acts. And Aaron says you can't because part of the nature of action is that it's unpredictable and it's anonymous and it's boundless and people can't be responsible for their acts. So that's why the, the second to last chapter of this book is on forgiveness. You have to forgive people the consequences of their actions because they know not what they do. Um, given these frailties of action, that it's boundless, that it's unpredictable, and that it's anonymous, and that it's dangerous and risky and it takes courage, it's a miracle, RN says, that we would act at all. I mean, the rational thing to do is to crawl under your rock and do nothing. Right? And that's what she calls the frailty of human affairs. It is purely rational, she says, to absent yourself from the humanly created world and live in private or in the social world and stay as far out of the public world as possible, to not get involved in politics, to not go and occupy Wall Street, to not go into the Tea Party, to not get involved. Right? And this, as you probably can gather, is for her a disaster because she thinks that what makes us human is to act and speak in politics and to engage in politics and thus to try and build great and immortal things and take those risks. And so uh, much of the rest of this chapter on action is an attempt to address solutions to the frailties of actions that allow people to engage in action and speech in public.